Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Today, my guest is researcher Gabrielle Charos. Gabrielle will take us deeper into the occult rabbit hole of Billy Shears, a.k.a. Paul McCartney, and explain how fallen angels, the Kabbalah, and Gematria tie into the Beatles' conspiracy and beyond. And so, without further ado, here's the show with Gabrielle. Well, friends, we have a great show for you this afternoon, and my guest is Gabrielle Charos, and Gabrielle is a researcher, and she's done a lot of work in the area of gematria, taken that gematria and brought it into the realm of the Beatles. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about, and I think it's going to be very, very interesting to to take a look at how the numbers play into the entire conspiracy. And as many of you have heard me say in the past, the occultists, the controllers, the conspirators, whatever name you want to give them, what they do is they paint by the numbers. And since Gabrielle is a first-time presenter and researcher on the show, I'm going to ask that she give us a little background on how she got to do the work that she's doing and how she got into Gematria. So Gabrielle, welcome to the show. And how did you get into this work? Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your show um, I've been watching you now for a couple of years, and you've had amazing guests, and you're always very well researched, and I really enjoy your presentations. Um, so it's a pleasure to be on your show today. As far as how I got into this whole Paul is dead conspiracy, or at this point, I guess it's not really a conspiracy. Basically, my father was an avid music lover, which of course he passed that on to me. So I, I love music, and he's been collecting records since, gosh, since he was early teens. So at this point, there's easily 10,000 records in my parents' garage. My dad did pass away in 2017, and he did leave his records to me. Um, So I can easily open up a record store at some point, uh, although I would never. You know, they're very sentimental to me. Um, But he was actually the the person that really loved the Beatles. I wasn't such a huge fan when I was younger, but I will tell you that my dad and myself had this hobby where we would read autobiographies of different music artists. And I read, I want to say I was probably 14 or 15, but I read a autobiography of John Lennon. And I have to tell you, that was a really good book that I read. And it renewed a passion in me, in me for the Beatles. John was, he came across as such an interesting character and he was, he was likable in the book that I read. So that's kind of how I got started back into the Beatles. Also, in my later years, I did meet my fiancé, another Michael, who was in a band for 12 years, and he's a singer. He's also a bass player, but he is an avid Beatles lover. And so that kind of renewed my passion with the Beatles again and starting to listen to their music. And in the process, I came across, again, the Paul is Dead conspiracy. And so I started to look into that because I'm a person that loves to read, and I just like to research mysteries. And that's kind of how I got started again. And as you know, Mike, once you uh, take the bait and you start researching the Paul is Dead uh, clues, you kind of go down a rabbit hole, hole and it's very deep. Yeah, it's almost endless. Yes. So that's kind of how I got started. So how does your Michael, where does he stand with the whole Paul is Dead and Beatles conspiracy? Is he uh, in the boat with you or does he say not? That stuff is just a bunch of nonsense. I have to tell you, he... He's definitely red pilled, so he's awake to a lot of uh, the realities of the world that we live in. I have to say, though, the Beatles are pretty sacred for him. He doesn't say much. I, I'm not sure that he necessarily disagrees. He's actually very excited that I'm going to be on this podcast with you, but I'm not sure he's quite all the way in the boat either. So he's still a, a huge Beatles fan. That's okay. It takes time. Like I said, I only got into the boat about four years ago. And it was a hard pill to swallow. Oh, yeah. It really was. Now, talking about a hard pill to swallow and me getting into it four years ago was because I, I read the memoirs of Billy Shears. And you've read the book, yes, Gabrielle? Yes, I've read the, bull, the blue book, the memoirs, nine after nine edition. Yeah. And what did you think of the book? Um, so I, I definitely want to give kudos to Thomas E. U. Harriet. Very well-written book. And one of the most enjoyable books I read on the level as far as I've never read a book that had so many layers to decode. Um, So mentally, I found that very stimulating. 
So I have to give him kudos that, that it was excellently written. As far as the book goes, uh, you know, there was a lot of interesting detail in there that uh, you can't deny. Only a person that has experienced this and went through these life experiences would be telling us these type of things. So I, I really believe a lot of what's in the book. The other thing about the book is I came across throughout reading, I felt a lot of sympathy and empathy for Billy. I feel that it's apparent to me in the book that he's tired of being recognized for all these characters that he's played throughout his lifetime. And he's ready to just be recognized just for himself. He's ready to shine as Bill Shepard, if that's the name that, that he really has. But he's wanting and he's been yearning to just be himself for a very long time. Yeah, as I've mentioned on a couple of shows, it has to be very difficult to go through an entire lifetime because basically it, it has essentially been an entire lifetime. It's 54 years now if we start from 1966. And nobody knows who William Shepard is or William Campbell or Billy Shears, whatever name you want to give him. Nobody knows who he really is. They only know him as Paul McCartney. And so he has this entire body of work and nobody knows who the real guy is. So I don't care how much money you have and how much fame you have. That's got to wear on you after a while, and you're going to want to let people know, hey, this is who I am. So I believe he is, and I agree with you, Gabrielle, he is at that point right now. And he has been for the last 10 years or so, because the first edition of Memoirs came out in September of 2009. So let's just say 11 years ago was when he put a stake in the ground and said, I'm going to tell my story. So with that, I know we want to uh, to get into the presentation, and your first chart, I'm looking at it, we have it up, is the Law of Reversal, and uh, it's about Crowley. Can you take us through that? Yes, thanks, Mike. So just for the audience, we're going to be laying a foundation, or I'm going to be laying a foundation with some general information about the occult and decoding the occult. This is going to be important, especially if you want to understand gematria and how it applies to the Beatles and some of the elements uh, of the clues that they have for us. Um, so we have to start with Crowley. This is a perfect place for any person to start. Alistair Crowley, in his teachings, he had some laws that his initiates should follow. And one of them was the law of reversal. A basic um, explanation of this law, hell is the reversal of heaven. So as above, so below. You may have recognized the symbols of, you know, the elites or famous people using their their four fingers and their thumbs to make a diamond shape. This represents that concept of as above, so below. For people who want fame, power, spell casting abilities, demons at their beck and call, and to recognize the Godhead within, as well as to attempt to know past, present, and future events, will practice Alistair Crowley's divination and rituals. Billy uh, claims that in the book he was tutored by Alistair Crowley until the age of eight, um, and this, he's made mention of this in the memoirs of Billy Shear's book. Alistair taught his students to consistently and with intensity practice talking in reverse speech, walking in reverse, thinking in reverse, and even playing records in reverse. Uh, all of these things are a form of divination. Uh, Bill states he is about the sixes and Paul's about the nines. As anyone can see, nines and sixes, in re they are reverses of each other. Um, so that's another uh, law of reversal, just using a nine for a six or a six for a nine. And so playing records in reverse, and I know we'll get into this a little later, but that would be the back masking that many bands do. It does go back to um, to the Beatles. It, it goes back to Led Zeppelin. Um, many have done it. Again, it's a practice that is still going on today in recordings where they're back masking. So these are backwards messages, folks. And maybe what I'll do at the end of this show is I will put one in that has to do with Stairway to Heaven, and we could take a listen to that. So did you want to move to slide number three, Gabrielle, and Michael Jackson? Absolutely. Michael Jackson actually had ties into the Beatles um, and also some of Alistair's teachings. He's a good example that some people of my generation will probably remember. Um, but he's another great example just to show us how this has continued throughout music, just as you mentioned. This is not something that the Beatles just did or just that that certain band, you know, practice. People that are really famous in the music industry have been practicing Alistair's, uh, Alistair Crowley's teachings for a very long time. Michael Jackson, I thought we'd go ahead and use him as an example. 
Um, so in this slide here, I have a title, Michael Jackson recruited by the Boule and Scottish Rite Freemason Secret Societies, question mark. So just for those of you who may not uh, know, the Boule is equivalent to the Skull and Bones, but it is a so secret society that is only available to black people or black initiates. Uh, the Skull and Bones did not allow black members into their society. Um, and even to this day, it's still um, they're still not allowing black members into their society. So the Boule is equivalent to that secret society. Um, Michael Jackson, to kind of lay the foundation for this, when he was part of the Jackson Five, he appeared at the Hollywood Palace in 1969. Um, he was on stage with Diana Ross and Sammy Davis Jr. Um, I've included a video clip that, Mike, I believe you might play for your audience. But basically, in this clip, it's very interesting because towards the end of the performance, Sammy Davis Jr. and his comedic way. He would, he would have the audience laughing with him, but he does make an odd comment to Michael Jackson and he gets down to Michael Jackson's level and he tells him, Michael, you can do anything you want to do, but if you turn Jewish, you're going to be in big trouble. Excuse me, Donnie. Okay. Can I talk to him for a second? You can have, I'm going to get down here because you're the shortest cat I know outside of Mickey Rooney. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. You can do anything you want to do, but if you turn Jewish, Michael, you in a lot of trouble. <laughs> So that seemed like a very odd comment to me. I remember my dad telling me about this years ago uh, when we were talking about something else. But basically, I think the, the lay person would just think maybe that's a racist comment or maybe, you know, the blacks and the Jews didn't get along or, you know, maybe Sammy Davis Jr. was making a joke about that. But in all actuality, if you understand the way the music industry works and still works to this day, what he was telling Michael is the Scottish Rite Freemasons or the Freemasons who are in charge of the entertainment industry and the music industry, even to this day, he was telling him, don't sign a contract with them because Motown Records, which is who uh, the Jackson 5 were with at that time, and also, of course, the Black Boule, they had nothing to do with the Scottish Rite Freemasons. And so he was telling Michael, hey, st stick with your own. Stick with the Boule. Don't go Jewish. Now, I know that this is, may come up. People might say, well, not all Freemasons are Jewish. That's correct. But as you move up the ladder and you get to certain degrees, you are at some point going to probably convert over to some form of Luciferianism. And Jewish mysticism or the Kabbalah is a form of Luciferianism that is practiced at these high levels. I did put a passage here to reference from the Bible that I know a lot of elite groups kind of refer to, and they kind of take this title as a reverence to them. But in Revelations chapter 3, verse 9, uh, the Bible talks about the fake Jews or people that lie to you and say that they're Jewish, uh, that they're the synagogue of Satan. And so a lot of times you may not be born a Jewish person, but when you get into these higher levels, you'll automatically convert over to this Jewish mysticism or you'll have a choice to do that. And then they, you just say that you're a Jew. Um, so, for example, the Rothschilds will tell you that they're Jewish, but they're fake Jews. They're not actually born Jewish people. So they're converts. So they're converts, but it, in a kind of a sinister way. And they, they embrace this title, the synagogue of Satan. So a lot of times you'll see a lot of symbolism with the occult based around this title, the synagogue of Satan. So I just wanted to mention that as well. So it's not a racial remark that Samuel Davis Jr. was telling Michael. He's not telling him don't be a Jew or that Jews are bad people. He's telling him don't sign a contract with those Masons. The Scottish Rite Freemasons stick with your own. Okay, so this goes back to something I was told by uh, a person who is um, Freemason, a high-level Mason, and they said to me that within the pyramid of power, there are factions, and these factions may not agree with each other on a strategy or an approach to get to the goal line, the end game as an example, right? So the end game being working everything toward the top of the pyramid. So they vie for position. So just so I understand, uh, as you're explaining this, the Boule are not Freemasons. No, they are not Freemasons, but they're a secret society. So, for example, Skull and Bones are also not Freemasons. They're another occult secret society. Okay, but could people in the Boule or could people who are Bonesmen become Masons? So... I want to clarify this as well. And this is based off of my research. Um, you know, obviously I'm not in these secret societies, but based off of the research that we have, the Illuminati, if you want to call that, I mean, it's the name of the Illuminati has changed through the years, but for right now we'll call them the Illuminati. Most people are familiar with that term. 
all of these secret societies feed in to the Illuminati. Right. The, you don't have to be a Freemason to be a part of the Illuminati, but you'll be probably part of one of the 13 bloodlines or loyal to one of those 13 bloodlines. So if you don't actually have the blue blood, but you are maybe a foot soldier for the, that bloodline, those bloodlines will all feed into the Illuminati. So what secret society you're part of isn't really the issue. They're all vying for power. So they all want to have the top spot closest to the, the capstone, but you know, they're not all Freemasons, for example. Okay. But didn't, uh, didn't Sammy convert to, uh, to Judaism? He did. He, he converted to Judaism and he even had a rabbi. Uh, the rabbi's name was William M. Kramer, who officiated at his 1961 wedding to Swedish actress May Britt. So obviously there wasn't a racist component to that. He was signaling in his masterful speaking, so to speak, uh, something different to Michael. He was communicating something else to Michael and other people in the know that might have been watching that show. I was reading into this research for this presentation. I was reading a little bit from Michael Jackson's autobiography that he has, um, Moonwalker or Moonwalking. And then um, you also have his brother, Jermaine, who made some interesting comments that Michael, out of all the brothers, he was the only one that would go with his dad to meet with business partners or older white men, as, as the way Jermaine put it in one of his interviews out of the brothers. So when Michael was young, Michael was the only one that was being taken to these elite meetings with his dad. Um, also in Michael's autobiography and also his brother Jermaine's interview, they all agree that Michael Jackson was the one that was beat the most by his dad, Joseph Jackson, um, because he was the most feisty uh, or of all of the, the boys. When Michael's dad was very strict with them and, and getting them on point ready for their performance, it was almost like he was the one specifically being groomed for a bigger role. Um, so I find that interesting as well. I know that the background of the Jacksons is that they were all raised Jehovah Witness, which is another religion that reveres angel worship, um, which is very similar to Jewish mysticism. But I, I think there was something else. I, and again, I haven't researched as much about Michael Jackson just yet, but I'm definitely going to start reading more of his autobiography because there's a lot of parallels between him and Bill and how they kind of seem to have been groomed at a very young age. It still seems a little odd to me, though, Gabrielle, that Sammy Davis Jr. makes that comment to Michael Jackson, yet Sammy Davis Jr. converted to Judaism. Do we have an understanding or a theory about how that came about? I do. So what I believe, so Sammy Davis Jr., and, and anybody can search this, he, was, he never hid the fact that he was a Satanist. Uh, he wore that title very proudly. He definitely was okay with the occult. Now, I will say this, just because Sammy Davis Jr. converted over to Judaism, he never left the boule. It doesn't mean he became a Freemason. What I believe happened is that at some point you want greater power with these demons or these entities. And just for your audience, I'm coming from the, the perspective that there is a supernatural realm. So I do want to make that clear to your audience. So when I'm speaking of these things and, and these occultists, Irregardless of what I think or what your audience may think, these occultists believe in a supernatural world. Alistair Crowley even wrote a separate book, um, 777, um, The Secrets of the Kabbalah and Other Mysteries. And, and I'm not, I might not be getting the title correctly. I have it written down in another slide here. But in that book, Alistair Crowley teaches that you, at some point, if you want greater power, you're going to need to start, uh, some of the practices of Kabbalah are helpful in the fact that they help you summon the Nephilim spirits. And just for your audience, if they're not familiar with the Nephilim, so in the Bible, most people are familiar with the fact that Lucifer was an angel, a morning star, and he fell when he rebelled against the Most High God, and he took a third of the angels with him to earth when they fell. So when they fell, they were no longer allowed into heaven as they were before, and that now they were in a different realm, right? They fell from a higher realm to a lower realm. And in that process, those angels, as they were roaming Earth, 200 of them, which were called Watchers, they were a certain class of angels, made a pact on Mount Hermon, which is in the Middle East. It's on the 33rd degree latitude and longitude. And so that's why 33 is a significant number a lot of times with these occultists, because it's giving reverence back to the fallen angels. But those angels made a pact, the 200 of them, they made a blood oath, and that's where your blood oaths or contracts will come from. And they agreed that they would take any punishment from the Most High, but they wanted to have relations with women. They wanted to have their own offspring. 
And so the Nephilim are actually the offspring of the fallen angels and human women. So when these Nephilim die, though, because they were in a, nat- a natural being that was created, when they died, their spirits were disembodied. They had no place to go. So like, for example, Mike, most people believe that when we die, either you're reincarnated or your spirit goes to heaven or you may possibly go to hell. Well, the Nephilim spirit, because they were uh, the Nephilim, because they were unnatural and they weren't a creation that the most high or the creator deemed was acceptable. It was an unnatural creation. Their spirits are doomed for eternity. And so they're, they're a, a disembodied spirit. So a lot of people or a lot of religions, let me rephrase, a lot of religions or a lot of thoughts of ancient knowledge, these spirits are what you would call your demons today, okay? And so in order to entice these Nephilim, Alistair Crowley taught that you're going to want to start practicing some, some of these rituals from Kabbalah. And so Sammy Davis Jr. converting over to Judaism doesn't surprise me. If you want more power, these Nephilim spirits are more powerful than just other entities, so it sounds to me like what you're saying is Sammy Davis Jr. converting over to Judaism was really converting over to Jewish mysticism and the Kabbalah. Correct. And possibly getting more power, stronger entities at his beck and call. Mm-hmm. Okay. I've got it now. Okay, I'm a little slow on the draw sometimes, but... <laughs> no, not at all. This stuff can get really deep and dark and you have to, in my opinion, you have to read a lot before you can start to put the pieces together. And because I've read so many books, you know, I can kind of put the pieces together, but it still gets a little bit confusing for myself as well. So please don't don't feel bad. <laughs> well, the reason why I ask is because a lot of people believe that that Freemasonry was commandeered by Jewish mysticism. But what I'm hearing now is that that may be so, but it was done because Freemasons or people in other secret societies wanted to have access to the Jewish mysticism of the Kabbalah. Yes, and and I should uh, I was going to say this for a later slide, but just to kind of explain the Kabbalah, it isn't necessarily only a Jewish mysticism practice. So just a little bit more on the background with Mount Hermon when the two hundred watchers made that blood oath pact and agreed to have their own offspring and and marry women. They gave their secrets or some secrets that were forbidden, angel knowledge. They gave this, pass this knowledge on to their wives and their offspring. So a lot of uh, the mysteries around the world, and I, I believe this, but a lot of other religions believe this as well. For example, the pyramids, the great megaliths, even just the astrology and the cosmology of how to chart the weather and chart the, the movement of the planets. All of that knowledge came to us from the fallen angels when they gave it to their, to their wives. They also gave knowledge of magic rituals and other other knowledge of greater power that mankind ne- wasn't necessarily supposed to have. And so the Egyptians and your pharaohs, it is believed that the sons of the fallen, so the sons of the watchers, the Nephilim were your pharaohs. They were your ancient gods. They were your Roman gods, your Greek gods. That's what's a, a common belief through a lot of these occult systems. And of course, the Nephilim, even though they lived a supernaturally long amount of time over a human, they weren't an eternal being as their fathers were, the fallen angels. So angels don't have a death. The Nephilim did have a death. And then when they died, their spirits were disembodied. Um, so that is one interesting aspect of that. Um, yes, Jewish Kabbalah does have a lot of the secrets and the practices and the rituals. Uh, the secret societies around the world, including the Vatican, so the Jesuits are a, a, a secret occult uh, sect as well. So I know that some people may or may not be familiar with that. I know that we currently have a Jesuit priest, but Madame um, Blavatsky. Blavatsky, thank you. She, in her book, it's interesting to know that she even talked about the Jesuit priests being the black sorcerers or the, the people that practice black magic. And coming from a very strong occultist, to hear somebody call another sect out like that, it makes you wonder about the Jesuits even more. Like, hmm, why, why is she saying that these Catholic priests are black magicians? And so I find that interesting. And you can even research that yourself. You just go and read some autobiographies on her. But she specifically calls out the Jesuit sect of the Catholic Church. She calls them your black sorcerers, your black priests. So uh, your black magicians. But all of these different secret societies are keepers of secrets and knowledge, and they all have different rituals that may not be revealed to the other 
secret societies. Uh, so, for example, one watcher may have given their line a different set of rituals than a different watcher. And so all of these secret societies, even though they're kind of related in the fact that they all come from this this Nephilim or this angel bloodline, they are keeping the secrets separate from even each other. So a lot of times when you see like the Boule or the Skull and Bones or the Vatican Jesuits or, you know, even the Queen and, and the Rosicrucians or different secret societies across the world, they all have a little something that they're keeping from the other the other secret societies. But like you said, they all have an, an end goal. They all answer to the Supreme being. In this case, it would be Satan or Lucifer. Um, and so they all have a global mindset. Uh, even Bill calls himself a globalist in the book. But like you said, they all have different ways of getting there and they all think that they're more powerful maybe than the other group. Yeah. So within the pyramid, there are these different factions. So, okay, this is very, very interesting. It really is. Did you want to move to slide four, or is there anything else you'd like to talk about with Michael Jackson? Uh, yes, let's move to slide four, because we're still on Michael Jackson. So for the audience, let's let's go ahead, because this does tie back into Sgt. Pepper and the Beatles. So let's go ahead and continue with him. So Michael did eventually convert over, though, and he did sign a contract. And I'm going to show some evidence that he did convert over to Gobala. Um, it's circumstantial. I'll leave it up to the audience to make up their own mind. But in my opinion, he did convert over. So if we go to slide four here, Michael Jackson did break ties with Motown Records in 1975. And he brokered a lucrative deal with Epic Records, um, which would allow the Jackson 5 to produce their own songs. Michael did make enemies with the Boulé Motown Records and his own father, Joe Jackson, when he made this move. OK, um, the Jackson 5 were not allowed to keep their name when they made the move over to Epic Records. Um, and so they just became the Jacksons at that point. Michael Jackson did convert over to Kabbalah. And I, like I said, in the next slide, I'll kind of show you some uh, circumstantial evidence. Michael went Jewish, quote unquote, against Sammy Davis Jr.'s warning. If you notice in this slide here, I have a picture of the Sgt. Pepper's album. And then you can notice that at the 1990, 1984 American Music Awards, where Michael Jackson won an astonishing eight Grammys and seven awards, he was also wearing a Sgt. Pepper uniform. And throughout his career, different, uh, his brothers may comment to this. He makes comments to it in the book that that's exactly what he was doing is he was paying reverence to the Sgt. Pepper album. In fact, he's wearing the same blue outfit as Billy. Exactly. He's wearing the same outfit as Billy. And Billy and him wrote two songs together in this earlier period. So Bill and him had a, a knew each other very well. Let's just put it that way at this point in his career. And so... I will make this reference. Some of your audience may be uncomfortable with this, but as I mentioned, he did make enemies with the Black Boule and Motown Records. There are people out there. So if you start getting into the Michael Jackson conspiracies or mysteries uh, that believe that the the tragic burning that he had with the Pepsi commercial uh, wasn't necessarily an accident, um, that could have been a uh, retribution. I'm not saying that I agree with that. I'm just throwing that out there for your audience to maybe research more because there's a lot of theories and some evidence that could back that up as well. If you want to go down that research uh, with Michael Jackson, but you can, I am confident in feeling that yes, he did make enemies with this group. And when he converted over, it wasn't at the blessing of his dad because his dad actually opened up his own record label. label. I believe it was Ivory Tower Records. You know, Joe Jackson and Michael makes reference to this in his autobiography. Joe Jackson was all about the money. And so for him, Michael Jackson was his golden cat calf. That was his cash cow right there. He would have preferred to keep Michael under his thumb with his record label so he could have gained the most out of it. Um, but Michael was able, once he signed the deal with, with Epic Records, basically signing with the Scottish Rite Freemasons, he was able to get out of the, under the thumb of his parents just a little bit. Of course, he met Elizabeth Taylor, and then he moved out of his parents' house, and Joe Jackson did not like that at all because he started having less and less control of Michael and Michael's money. Fascinating. Very, very fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Michael Jackson's quite a character, and what we're learning here, at least what I'm learning here, is some of the backstory that clearly we, we weren't told or we wouldn't know about. Did you want to continue on to slide five and continue on with Michael Jackson? Yeah, so if we continue on with Michael Jackson, so I'm going to give, like I said, circumstantial evidence to show that I believe he did convert over to Scottish Rite Freemason. 
uh, the, the Scottish Rite Freemasons and that he did become a Kabbalist. So in this slide here, um, I have some snapshots of him wearing the Sergeant Pepper uniform or a military type uniform throughout his career. Um, you'll notice the colors here. We have blue, red, black, and white. So in the harem, which is the codices of the Scottish Rite Freemasons, anyone can look up the harem and you'll kind of get a foundation for what their beliefs are or what their practices are for the layperson. Um, but there is a chapter in there about the colors of the Scottish Rite Freemasons. And they tell us that blue is without question the fundamental color of the craft Freemasons. The alchemical colors, so the magical colors, are red cr or crimson, black and white. Um, and then these are the mainstay colors of the Scottish Rite Freemasons. And so you can see that Jack, Michael Jackson give, is giving reverence, in my opinion, to the Scottish Rite Freemasons in the uniforms and colors that he wore throughout his career. What was the deal with Brooke Shields? So when <laughs> Michael Jackson had developed a friendship with Brooke Shields and in his autobiography, he say, says that they connect over, they connected over the fact that she was a childhood star and had to deal with fame at a very young age like himself. She also um, was groomed, and, and that's apparent when you start to read his autobiography, um, when he talks about her. Um, and then even when you go back to interviews with her, she was groomed, and she actually was born into an elite family as well. I think they just uh, bonded over a friendship because they had some a lot of things in common. She was also a Kabbalist, but what I learned from his autobiography, it actually I thought it was her at first that got him into it. It was actually Elizabeth Taylor that talked Michael Jackson into becoming a Kabbalist uh, and practicing that a little bit more. I know that that was a little bit later on. So I think here when he becomes a Scottish Rite Freemason, he still has his Jehovah Witness roots. But at some point, it was a natural progression for him to go into Kabbalah. One thing I do want to just mention, and this is just for people out there, Mike, and this will, you'll find this interesting. Uh, the way that it's put in some of these research sites that I was looking at, Black Michael and White Michael, um, those aren't my words. Those are just things you can find on the Internet. But if you notice here with Brooke Shields, because you brought her up, do you notice the height of Michael Jackson to Brooke Shields? So she was six foot even. And in this picture, she's wearing flats. So uh, there's other pictures you can find with Michael Jackson in this this costume or this uniform and Brooke Shields. Um, they went to some award ceremony here. And you can see that she's de he's definitely a lot shorter than her. If you look at white Michael Jackson, they said he was close to six feet himself. And at this time, Michael Jackson would have been in his mid-20s, just like Paul would have been. And he was definitely a lot shorter. And at some point, he gets a lot taller. His ear shape changes. There's a lot of things that change about his features. His hands are a lot bigger. And so I started to look at those things, but I said, oh, goodness, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole just yet. But there are a lot of people that wonder if Michael himself hadn't been replaced at some point, uh, because you do have what they call black Michael and then white Michael. And there's def definite height differences, uh, shoe size differences, hand size differences, uh, markers like Bill pointed out to us in the book, like ears, you can't necessarily change as much. And the ears are definitely a lot different as well when you start looking at some of the pictures in comparison. Yeah, I'm familiar with the conspiracy that Michael Jackson was also swapped out. The rabbit hole is just incredibly deep. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention about these pictures, Gabrielle, to add on to what you said, these were my thoughts. So he's wearing blue, as you mentioned, very similar to the outfit that Billy was wearing on Sergeant Pepper, but it also can represent the Blue Lodge of Freemasonry. Right. And in the next picture, he's wearing red. And you said that's the alchemical color of masonry, but it is also representative of the Red Lodge. And then in the third picture, he's got black and red. Black, red, and white are the colors of the Illuminati. And I've actually seen Billy decked out in black, white, and red as well. And uh, in the last picture, where we have white Michael Jackson, I guess, he's, uh, he's decked out in black and white, which is um, the colors of duality. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that aside from everything that you brought up here is that when they dress and display themselves the way that they do, it is not just one single message that they're trying to, to get across. Many times the symbolism is multifaceted. Absolutely. And, and the, the other thing is, Mike, just to add on to that, they're not just signaling to their their superiors or other elitists, 
And a lot of times they're, they're, uh, communicating with their, the spirits that have attached to them. That, that is another thing. Um, and you'll actually hear Johnny Depp, Madonna, you'll hear a lot of these people who are really into this or open about it, I guess I should say. They're not as necessarily secret about it. Uh, when you start to listen to their interviews or you start to hear them, uh, just free, you know, freely talking about these things, they'll talk about the spirits that are attached to them. And so th- this is, um, you know, because these are alchemical colors, quote unquote, uh, these seem to please the spirits that they've, they've had attached to them. Well, that would be like Madonna having this dual personality, right? Is it Madam X or something? Beyonce also has a, another persona. Sasha Pierce. Yep. Okay. There you go. So it, it's kind of interesting because you see this happening too. It's not just a one off. You have these celebrities and these artists saying they have this other personality or this other persona that inhabits their body when they step on stage. That's the thing that you hear. When I go to perform, it's as if somebody else steps in or something else steps in and takes over yep. my performance. Most people, lay people will hear that and think, oh, it's just the adrenaline going. You know, you're getting yourself all geared up. You're just a, an unbelievable performer. But the truth of the matter is there probably is something else stepping into their mind and body taking over at that point in time. Well, absolutely. And actually, that's part of the mysticism of Kabbalah or, you know, some of these other magic cults is you actually are summoning spirits and you are opening your chakras because the human body, we're very electrical. We're mostly water, but there's a lot of electricity happening with us. And so the chakras of the body, they're they're mostly closed unless you become enlightened, so to speak. Those doorways are open. And that electricity actually allows us to, uh, and the pineal gland and the third eye, that allows us to access the outer realm that we currently don't have, have access to on Earth. So when you open up your chakras, you're actually opening up your antenna, so to speak, so that you can communicate with these other beings. That is one one part of the Jewish mysticism as well. Kabbalah will teach you how to open up your chakras and open up your pineal gland. Another thing, just a quick note on that as well, Drugs are also another doorway into helping you to open up or open up your chakras or your pineal gland so that you can communicate with the, the veil on the other side. Well, this goes hand in hand with what I presented in my four and a half hour presentation and the human potential movement, which then was rebranded into the new age movement. And they teach all about that. Yeah. So what we have is essentially a, uh, a version or elements of the Kabbalah making its way into the mainstream via New Age practices. Absolutely. And again, celebrities, they make it appealing, right, to uh, the general masses or the general population. Like, hey, I want to wear a red string or I want to wear a Kabbalah. But without the rituals or understanding of exactly um, the chants or the rituals or the magic that needs to take place or the blood sacrifice, it's just wearing a red string. So I do want to sh- share that with people. You know, for example, we're going to be talking about gematria here shortly. Gematria on its own is just a way to decode some of these messages. Unless you're practicing all the rituals and all the the magic and blood sacrifice that goes with it, you're only using it as a decoder or a cipher. Um, same thing with I'll, I'll see a lot of these teenagers oh wear red strings and they're like oh I'm I'm you know it's Kabbalah. They might start reading about it, but Unless you actually do the rituals or the prayers, for example, they also call them prayers that go along with this, you're not really enticing or invoking any spirits or any any of that magic. You're just wearing a red, red string. Yeah, all you're doing is advertising it, really. Absolutely. Uh, slide six, Gabrielle? Yeah, so this is an interesting slide, just kind of based on what you're saying with, you know, Beyonce and some of these other artists. I actually found an interview so it was the Newsweek magazine article from January 10th, 1983 on page 53. Um, Jackson said this, and this is a quote. I wake up from dreams and go, wow, put this down on paper. The whole thing is strange. You hear the words, everything is right there in front of your face. And you say to yourself, I'm sorry, I didn't write this. It's there already. I feel that somewhere, someplace has all been done and I'm a courier bringing it into our world. So there you go again. Michael Jackson's kind of telling us that when he does his songwriting, he doesn't feel that he's writing his song. It's like it's already there for him and it's being communicated to him to bring it to the other side. This is very similar to what 
Bob Dylan said in an interview with uh, 60 Minutes with Ed Bradley going back a number of years ago, I guess about 20 years ago or so, um, he said almost the exact same thing. Well, and we even read that with in the memoirs book. Yesterday. Yesterday, yeah, where Paul woke up and he's like, is, is this my song or was it somebody else's song? And if he apparently asked a lot of his friends, um, bandmates, like, hey, do you guys recognize this melody? And once he was confident that it wasn't anybody was going to claim it, then he said it was his. Now, I know you gave some information about that in your, your big presentation about whether the Beatles wrote all of their music. Um, and you had a great take on that as well. But I just think it's interesting that different celebrities or even like Michael Jackson's interview, they're telling us that they're getting their information from another entity or beyond this world. Yeah, in the in the presentation, I put forth the possibility that yesterday was an, an old Italian Neapolitan song that was reworked. And these pictures are very interesting that you have here, Gabrielle. So here's a circumstantial piece that I was talking about. So if you notice, Michael Jackson, and there, I, I'm going to tell you, your audience, just do any Google search with Michael Jackson pictures. He's wearing the red Kabbalah string constantly. So it, it's not something new. On the left hand is where he wears it, and that's um, a form of protection. He even wore this Kabbalah string through all of his court cases. You'll see him on the stand, you know, testifying, and you'll have his red Kabbalah string. It should have seven knots to make it a Kabbalah string, and then, of course, there's certain chants and prayers that need to go into it before it can be a, a form of protection. It is believed by Kabbalah that it wards off evil things or evil intentions of other people on you, and it does word off misfortune brought about by the evil eye. And then you can also see just symbolism. So again, Michael Jackson in the third picture, he's in black and white, and he's, of course, doing the one-eye symbolism. Um, and even at a young age, as I suspected based off of my research, he had already been re being recruited and being groomed for his role. And so he's already flashing the 666 sign as far back as the Jackson 5. Yeah, and my understanding is the peace sign is actually the number 11. It's a representation of the master number 11. Yes, it can be the number 11 and also can be a form of the Baphomet. So you have to be careful, Mike. So, for example, when they're doing the peace sign, it's just as important to look at their, their right hand or their opposite hand because a lot of times they'll, they'll be doing the peace sign in reverse, and so that'll be referenced to the Baphomet. And so I started looking. So right now in this picture, we can't see what Michael's doing with his other hand, but you'll oftentimes catch celebrities or elitists when they're on stage when they're doing the peace sign, look at their other hand. A lot of times they're also doing it in reverse. So reverence to the back of them. Okay. And then the first picture is interesting to me because he has a mask on, which is what they have everybody doing today. I know. Who would have thought Michael Jackson's trend would come back in 2020 with COVID? <laughs> Very interesting. And my understanding of the mask or one of the, um, the aspects of wearing the mask is silence. Yes. So just symbolism galore. And look at him as a little kid with the 666 sign. Yes. He probably didn't know what he was doing, but they had it staged. But the point being is uh, it doesn't matter whether he knows what he's doing or not. They're putting him on that um, They're putting him on that path. Right. And he was being groomed. Exactly. He's being groomed. Exactly. That's a great chart, Gabrielle. Thank you. And then just to continue uh, with, you know, building some of the circumstantial evidence for your audience that he was a Scottish Rite Freemason, that he did follow the Kabbalah. Um, I wanted to take us into the next slide here, which I also, it's more, more interesting circumstantial evidence. But again, so the Masons have different um, sections of them, right? But I believe it's the Scottish Rite Freemasons who run the American music industry and entertainment industry. And if we look at his Neverland Ranch, this is the opening gate uh, in the top left-hand corner. And you can see the symbol here. He has a lion and he has a unicorn. So the lion is the symbolism for England, and the unicorn is a symbol, symbolism for Scotland. So he's showing reverence to Great Britain or to the Scottish Rite Freemasons and also um, other sections of Freemason that are started in, in England. Um, so I think that that's interesting. Um, he's not using the Jackson family crest. He's using a crest that, that shows reverence to Great Britain, the Queen possibly, and also Scotland. Um, if we look at the bottom corner, we talked about the black and white checkerboard of the Freemasons. Simple way to say it. I'm not sure they, they call it the checkerboard, but, or the chessboard. But you can see that, you know, uh, in this album, it, it's very, there's a lot of occult symbolism. 
he talks about blood on the dance floor is the title of the album. He's dressed in crimson red blood and he's dancing on a Masonic checker black and white board. So that's common with, with occult symbolism in the music industry. And then to the right, I just wanted to show some more evidence of angel worship here. Again, like I mentioned, Jehovah Witnesses do have a form of angel worship in their theology, but also Jewish mysticism or Kabbalah, they really conjure up and they ask these uh, fallen ones for their help. Um, so there's a lot of angel worship as well in the Kabbalah or Jewish mysticism. And so Michael Jackson, this was a painting that was hung in his uh, Neverland Ranch. I'm not sure if he had this moved to the Beverly Hills location where he was found dead later on, but it definitely was hanging in the Neverland Ranch. And it, it's a painting um, where Michael Jackson himself had himself painted as the Archangel Michael. Um, and in the painting, you'll see that it says, I'm a multidimensional creature, which is what angels would be. They're multidimensional. So they can come for, to our realm, but they can also you know, manifest in our realm, but they're also from different realms. Um, and so there's a lot of symbolism in this painting, just occult wise. But the biggest thing is I wanted to show that, you know, he is uh, showing reverence to an archangel in this picture. Yeah, it's filled with all kinds of symbolism. You could spend probably weeks decoding that picture. Absolutely. Um, and the thing about Michael, and I chose this picture, he had so many different paintings of him uh, painted as angels. So he had paintings in the Neverland Ranch of himself as a cherub. Uh, where he just had like a loincloth kind of wrapped around him, but he's basically naked. He had pictures of him uh, with angel wings. So he really, if you looked at his uh, self-portraits that he had painted for him, he really bought into this idea of himself as an angel or being depicted as one class of angel or another. So archangels, are they uh, synonymous with the fallen angels? There may have been archangels that fell with Lucifer, because there, there are legions of angels. So, you know, he, Lucifer took a third of the angels with him. And what's interesting to understand is that there are different classes of angels. So, for example, I mentioned a couple. I mentioned watchers. Uh, there are cherubs. Uh, there's powers, principalities. You'll have the seraphim, which are serpent-like beings. Um, some believe Lucifer might have been a seraphim. Some believe he might have been a cherub. One thing that is, if, if you go by the, the Bible, which is an ancient text, um, or the, the Torah, which is, you know, also an ancient text, or maybe even the Zohar, all agree that Lucifer had praise and worship abilities. He had singing abilities. He was the, the archangel of that class of things that were over music. So I do find it interesting that through these occult and secret societies that they, they tend to infiltrate through music and through singing. And the fact that Lucifer was was the archangel or the, the man in charge or the angel in charge of, of worship and singing and music. So not that all archangels are fallen. Some archangels fell with Lucifer. OK, and, and just take me through the Watchers. Who exactly are they? The Watchers were a class of angels that the, the, the one high God or the creator, we'll call him that, he created this class of beings to watch over humanity or to watch over his creation. And so as uh, I guess I'll call it legends or as stories, because I've actually read a lot of Native American literature as well. As a lot of ancient myths or legends go, uh, these watcher beings, as they were looking over the earth, creation and also humanity, they see human doing all sorts of things, including having relations, having children, and some of them begin to lust after what mankind's able to do because you have to realize angels are not allowed to have offspring. So humans were a unique creation at the time, um, and God says he created us in his image. And so we, ha in, in part of that is that we have the ability to procreate. We have the ability to reproduce after our own kind, and angels don't. Now, angels are a more powerful being. However, they are not able to reproduce. So whenever the, the watchers, these two, and there was 200 of them specifically, Sam was, a, uh, and that's the, the, the head watcher that was said to have uh, enticed these other 200 watchers to come along and do this flood oath with him at Mount, on Mount Hermon. But Sam um, wanted to have his own offspring. And so they found that Females or, or human women were the key to that. And so the offspring that happened from this union uh, created the giants of the world. And 
I will say that where I live in New Mexico, um, I have actually worked with a lot of Native American tribes. And to this day, a lot of the medicine men or um, the shaman of some certain tribes have told me that they have giant bones hidden that they still use in their own rituals that are between 15 and 20 feet tall. Um, they are hidden. They won't tell people where they're at um, because they said that when, in past times when they did reveal some of the locations of those giants, the giant bones, that Catholic churches came in, built the Catholic church right over that uh, sacred site, took all the giant bones and didn't allow the Native Americans access to their sacred site anymore. They also said that the, the U.S. government did that. So until they were given land grants, um, now they have an agreement with, with our government that they're not to reveal to anybody where those sites are, but also the government will just leave them alone and let them have their rituals and let them do their own things. Now, whether people want to believe that or not, it's just a story that I'm telling you from my own personal experience in working with children on these Native American tribes and making relations and just having talk. I have been told that giant bones are present here on certain tribes that they use in their rituals. But supposedly, that to tie this back to the Watchers and the Union with Women, those giants that were created uh, were an unnatural union. And a lot of times when you go back into ancient myths as well with these Watchers, and these women, a lot of times women would die in childbirth because these these beings that they were carrying in them were unnatural. And they, and they uh, would tear through their stomachs. They You'll have a lot of women just die during childbirth. Some some women sur- were fine and survived, but it is not uncommon to find a lot of these type of myths when you go back into ancient lore about uh, humans and God unions or human and angel unions. So some of the watchers actually fell as well. Yes. So in the, in that third of the angels that Lucifer took, a lot of other, so not the Bible, but a lot of other ancient texts, apparently he took angels from all different classes with him. So yeah, there, there are a lot of different types of, of angels that fell with Lucifer. It's not just one type of angel. The Watchers would be one of them that fell. Very, very interesting, Gabrielle. And I also got you way, way off track. And so, I think we have to swing back to slide number eight and finish up on Michael Jackson and then get into the Gematria piece of the presentation as it pertains to Billy. So my apologies, and let's move to slide eight. Yes, and so kind of just to bring this all together, Mike, I know that we've kind of you know shown a little bit of occultism and symbolism with him up to this point, but the moonwalk is walking in reverse. So basically that would be practicing one of, Crowley's laws or his teachings, let the adept initiate learn to walk backwards. And so it is my belief, um, and I believe, I think you agree with this as well, that the moonwalk was in reference to that law. It's just interesting how all this works together, but that'll lead us into the next slide where we talk about the backmasking of albums. Um, and you kind of talked about this a little bit already. Um, so if we look at slide nine here, Crowley also has in his laws to listen to albums in reverse, to talk in reverse, but also to listen in reverse. So here in the memoirs book, Bill tells us about the Beatles, how they backmasked clues of Paul being dead in their songs. And so I put a link here to YouTube. You might have better links, but this one just had a a good compilation of different backmasked albums that the Beatles have had. So they had a nice compilation. So if your audience wants to listen into that or uh, look into it, but Bill tells us on page 59, he even makes another reference to the doors. And he says that break on through, back mask, I am Satan. Um, so Bill is even telling us that. And when you check it, he is correct that you can clearly hear the doors on that song, back masking, I am Satan. Okay, well, I'll include that link in the show notes, Gabrielle, so the audience can take a listen. Okay. And then I wanted to go to the next one, slide 10. So still with the backmasking of, of songs in albums, as you mentioned before, this practice is still happening today. Um, I did want to draw your guys' attention, and I have the link here, so if your audience wants to listen to it. Um, but Michael Jackson's Beat It song played backwards, it is without doubt very clear. You can hear, I believe it was Satan in me. And it is his voice. It is not even like really choppy. It is clear as day. And it's even kind of gave me a little bit of chills when I heard it. For some reason, his backmask versus some of the others examples uh, really gave me that chill. When I heard it, I'm like, whoa, you know, but we can see that that Michael Jackson not only was using the moonwalk in uh, practicing Alistair's holy law, but he was also backmasking his albums as well at this point. I 
I also have Lady Gaga as an example, her song Paparazzi. Um, if you play her song, that song backwards or in reverse, you'll hear, and it's pretty clear as well, evil save us, these stars above, above, we model it on the arts of Lucifer. <laughs> Um, and so you can hear that over and over when you're listening to her album, that song, Backmask, or In Reverse. I thought that was interesting just because of the fact that the fallen angels are also referred to as shooting stars or fallen stars. Um, and so, again, in Jewish mysticism or Kabbalah, it is all angel worship. And so that's another reverence to those angels. And then I also put an example here of Kanye West's album, Jesus is King. That's a more recent album. Uh, supposedly, he converted over to Christianity. Um, and he put out this worship album, but there is quite a, a few songs where he re uh, references, references himself as the wolf. Um, but in Selah, it, there, you can clearly hear a chant of the wolf chant over and over on that particular song. So I just included that link. Um, but I do encourage your, your audience to go ahead and look at other songs on some of these albums, because these aren't the only songs on these albums that are back masked with messages. I'll put the actual back mask into the video, Gabrielle. And so I guess what Kanye West is doing is he's saying he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. I guess maybe that's the insinuation, possibly. Possibly, because I think it's just interesting that, you know, the Bible talks about beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. And then he puts out this Christian worship album. But then on several songs, he does a wolf chant or, or references, references himself as a wolf. Yeah, and Lady Gaga, I, I've watched some of her videos. I try not to, but they are very dark and very occulted. Oh, yes. Uh, she's um, a student of Abramovich. So she's actually been tutored, just as Billy was tutored by Alistair. Apparently, Lady Gaga spent quite a bit of time with Abramovich, and she's been tutored. She's a personal student of Abramovich. Uh, and so the thing about Abramovich is she will never tell you she's a Luciferian because she worships Einsop. Einsoff is a snake in the tree, and that's a Kabbalah reference, but basically it's a similar entity. Again, masterfully speaking, if you call her a Luciferian, she's going to say, well, I'm not a Luciferian. I don't worship Lucifer. She worships the snake in the tree, Einsoff. So that's another way occultists will kind of deceive you. They all believe in this basic Luciferian hierarchy, but they may worship. You want to call their entity by the correct name before they'll admit to what they worship. You know, once you understand masterfully speaking, it really does open up a box of knowledge because you now understand they're speaking encoded and uh, it's a layered way of speaking. And once you learn how to peel back the topical layers, you can get to the true meaning of what it is they're trying to communicate. Absolutely. And they can even get, get away with telling you that they're not lying to you because, again, like in her case, you didn't mention the correct name of the entity that she's worshiping. So, yes, she may be in the Luciferian system, but you didn't say you worship in the Luciferian system. You told her you, you worship Lucifer. So she was able to reply no and get away with it. Your point is well made because people will say to me, Billy's a liar. And I said, actually, no, he's not, because he's been telling you from day one that he's not biological Paul McCartney. It's just that we, and I put myself in this category, too, because at one point I was there. I didn't understand the masterfully speaking piece of this thing. And once you do and you see all the clues in the songs, the, the clues in uh, interviews, then you can see, no, he's actually telling you he's not biological Paul McCartney. So in his mind, he's thinking, I'm not lying to you. If you understood what it is I'm doing or how I'm speaking, you would understand that I'm not being deceptive. I'm, I'm not lying. This is how they present it and how they think. Absolutely. This is how they communicate. Um, and this is how they're able to deceive you without and getting away with their good karma, because they're always concerned with keeping good karma, um, because they could justify to themselves. Well, I didn't lie to you. They just didn't ask the right question.
Okay, so I think, Gabrielle, we are moving on to slide 11. Yes. And so this is a more foundation for your audience. So I just want to let you guys know, thanks for hanging in there. All of this is laying a foundation so that you have a better understanding for the Gematria decode of the Beatles um, album coming up. So the Faustian bargain um, is an important topic that I think we needed to touch on. We are all judged when we die. Um, but especially when you enter into a Faustian bargain, it is believed that uh, upon your death is your judgment day. Okay. So just some basic background information. Um, chapter 38 of the Blue Book of Memoirs, Bill tells us that biological Paul McCartney and John Lennon made a Faustian bargain for the success of the Beatles. Um, they did that at the Stockholm uh, Swedish studio on 10 24, 1963. He also indicates to us in that chapter that this bargain only applied to the original Beatles members. And so he does tell us that when a Faustian bargain is made uh, or a band, a rock band makes a pact with Satan for success, that a band member will have to die. They'll have to be sacrificed. So it can't just be an accident. There has to be a sacrifice made. Uh, so blood has to be spilled for the, the agreement to be uh, to be fulfilled. I know that this may be hard for some people to understand or to get. Um, so I'll just give you some basic information about a Faustian bargain. Faustian bargains are where an individual makes an agreement with an entity, an ancient god, a Nephilim, Satan himself, or a different uh, spiritual being, um, and they make this bargain in blood. The individual agrees to sell their soul or have an early ad- early death in exchange for something like fame and fortune, as an example. You must denounce all doctrines and slavery of religion or God before you can make a Faustian bargain. This is a lot- lifelong relationship with a demon or the entity that you made the, the commitment with. You can't change your mind with this demon once you have signed your blood in your blood. This is a permanent agreement, and that is why many may become uncomfortable during the course of their relationship. A lot of times people don't understand that um, this isn't just having this demon at your beck and call for reasons of power or your own personal reasons. You're also at the demon's beck and call. And just to give a quick example on this, You'll have a lot of stars that may have entered into these agreements, like actresses or singers or famous people. And then you'll hear of them not being able to sleep or having nightmares. They might become alcoholics or drug addicts. A lot of times they're just trying to cope with these demons or spirits that they've invited into their lives, and they don't know how to get rid of them. And a lot of this goes back to that Faustian bargain. Also, as an example, in Bill's memoirs book, he does tell us that biological Paul, not long after this Faustian bargain was made, he started having a lot of dreams about his early death and the fact that he would have to be replaced in the Beatles band. Um, so that I found that interesting as well, that that pretty much immediately happened after the bargain. They eventually went to Vernon Mosher, who studied under Aleister Crowley, to consult with him to see what was going on. And Vernon told him straight out, you made a Faustine bargain. And apparently John and, and Paul were like, well, we didn't really take that serious. And he told him, well, no, you've entered into this agreement. And he told Paul, you've been the one selected to be sacrificed. And he even went as far as to tell Paul when, what his timeline, how much time he had left. Now, Bill doesn't elaborate for us exactly what rituals took place. He doesn't elaborate to tell us when Vernon told Paul that he would would pass along or die or be sacrificed. But he just tells us that they had this meeting with Vernon. Um, and then from that meeting, Vernon arranged for John Lennon and Paul McCartney to meet with Kenneth Anger so that they could get more insight as to what they needed to do to prepare for the success of the Beatles and how they would move forward. Yeah, this is one of the very dark parts of the book. Some people are not going to be able to get their heads wrapped around this, but when you do the research, Gabrielle, like you have, and, and I've looked into it as well, this is how it works. So he entered into the, the pact in 1963, and then three years later, he was he was dead. He was dead. And like I mentioned, Bill tells us that this wasn't the only band that uh, entered into a pact at that time with Satan, that other bands entered into a Faustian bargain, and that one band member was always killed in these incidents or sacrificed. Right. And a Faustian bargain is a deal with the devil. And one of the, uh, the, the other bands that Bill spoke about in the book was uh, the Rolling Stones and Brian Jones. Right. And I think he mentioned Led Zeppelin, which would mean John Bonham. And, you know, I'm, 
I'm remembering, did he also mention John Denver? I didn't remember John Denver in, in that chapter 38, so I don't believe he mentioned him in that chapter. Okay, somewhere in the book he mentions John Denver, but in any case, uh, he does give us some examples, and he did spend um, a bit of time telling us about Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones and his alleged dying from drowning in the pool. But what he was telling us, as you're, as you're telling us here, is, is that um, the death of Brian Jones was not an accident. No. And as a matter of fact, he even elaborates in this chapter that an accident is not going to fulfill the bargain. It has to be a sacrifice. So he even goes on to mention how John Lennon being killed and the attempted stabbing of George were overkills or over sacrifices for the same bargain. And he, Bill goes on to tell us that he, himself and Ringo were exempt because they were not original band members. He alludes to the fact that Paul's accident, car accident wasn't an accident. It was a sacrifice. But then John Lennon was an over sacrifice and that they attempted kill on, on George was also again part of this original bargain for an over sacrifice. Right. And you made an important point here. Uh, it can't be an accident, but what they do do is it appears to be an accident, but the accident was actually put into play. So in other words, the death is premeditated and it's cloaked in an accident. I think you and I are in agreement that biological Paul McCartney died on September 11th, 1966. And as we'll continue on with the, the study into the occult and their symbolism, 9-11 has always been a very dark date for numerous historical events that were pretty awful. And I don't, that was not by, by accident that that date was chosen. So however the car accident happened, or even if that is the official way that, that Paul died, I mean, I think that most people believe that that's what happened. But again, we don't have any uh, we only have circum circumstantial evidence that that's what happened. But in either case, he was sacrificed on a significant occultic date. The reason why I brought up the, the bit about the accident is because sometimes I get comments on my YouTube channel and they'll say, uh, well, it can't be a ritual because it was an accident. And people think a ritual means that you're flayed or that they drive a stake through your heart. And that's not how it works. No. These sacrifices, they come in the form of, or at least the appearance of an accident. But as I mentioned earlier, that accident would not have happened if they did not enter into this bargain. Absolutely. Um, they took, they changed the course of their life through supernatural means. And, and so this is kind of the judgment that they have is they'll, uh, a lot of times these things take place in an unnatural way. You know, anytime you have a young person die, it's tragic anyways. Whether they say it was a drug overdose or, you know, a car accident. I'll give you another recent example. Chester Bennington, when he was uh, killed, he, he was found hanging from a doorknob, which is another sign occult signature for a death. But they said it was a, a suicide. So Kurt Cobain's another one they said was a suicide. But there's you, you always find other occult symbolism pointing to the fact that uh, actually it probably wasn't a suicide or it probably wasn't an overdose for the general masses. They point you in that direction. But then if you dig deeper, you can kind of see their signatures in the way that they're, they're, that they're killed. And you can also start to see that they're pointing, uh, there's hidden symbolism to show that this wasn't an, an accident, that it was actually intentional. Okay. I just want to make sure we talk about that a little bit, because like I said, sometimes, um, when I get these comments, it's not clear to, to the audience, and maybe it's because I'm not clear when I explain it, so I'm trying to do that here. Well, no, it's not that, Mike. I think a lot of times people are just, if, it, if it, this is new to them, they just have a lot of questions, and it takes, they need to hear the information in several different ways before they could absorb it. So it's not you by any means. It's just that sometimes people need that patience to make sure they fully understand. Okay, well... Did you want to go to uh, slide 12? Yes. So for the audience here, we are at the Gematria part of our presentation. So we finally made it there. And thank you so much for, you know, your patience up to this point. Um, so for you, for those of you who are not familiar with what Gematria is, put simply, Gematria is the representation of the alphabet and numbers and the order 
uh, will be read forward and also in reverse. We have to go back to Alistair's law of reversal. So anytime you're doing gematria and you're using one cipher, you want to make sure you also use that same cipher in reverse to get the full symbolism. Okay. Um, also, th- we did talk a little bit about Kabbalah. Kabbalah is important to Gematria. Uh, Kabbalah has its roots in ancient Babylon. It's pre-Diluvian, meaning that it's pre-flood, Noah's flood in the Bible. Um, and ancient texts have passed along the knowledge of Kabbalah to us. Again, this information is from the fallen angels and the information that they gave to humans, humankind through their wives that they, they married. So the watchers, when they married humans, they gave this knowledge to them. Okay. Gematria, if we go to the next slide, slide 13, uh, Gematria is a cipher to decode. So it's like a decoder so that we can understand the num, uh, the numbers and their meaning with the occults. Uh, sometimes they'll have certain words. So for example, this is a, a good one for Beatles fans. EMI records is I am he. So if you read it in reverse, you know, Alistair talked about that, you know, I am he. It's just a play on EMI, so it's a reverse of that that code. Um, but a lot of times, occultists will use numbers as well, and they'll be communicating certain words to us. So Gematria will help us decode that, okay? Also, EMI in Pythagorean numerology equals nine. Okay, so let's move to 14, and then we'll get into the decode. All right, so um, on the next slide here, Mike, we have the Gematria ciphers that I'll be using to decode uh, the Revolver album with the Beatles. I'm going to be using ordinal reduction. And of course, again, like I mentioned, you want to make sure you use the reverse of those. So we're also going to be using reverse ordinal and reverse reduced. Okay. Um, I am using a Gematria calculator from gematriaeffect.news, which I think you'll link in your, your show notes. It's a calculator by Zachary Hubbard. For those of you who are interested in Gematria and want to learn more about the differences, I recommend his $5 digital download book. It's over 800 pages. It's definitely worth the five bucks if you're interested in Gematria. I do want to point out the reason the reduction Gematria decodes is because those particular ciphers are meant for the English language and our 26-letter alphabet. And so they are perfect to use with our English language. Which ones are those? It's the simple English Gematria or ordinal, the Pythagorean Gematria or reduction, because that's a separate name for it, And then, of course, the reverse of those two ciphers. So there will be four ciphers in total, two forward and two backwards. Okay, and and those four are the ones that fit with our alphabet? Correct. They they fit with the English alphabet, and they were specifically designed for our 26-letter alphabet. Okay, got it. Um, If we go to slide 15, we're going to start some of the decode. And so you'll notice the Gematria calculator, like I mentioned, that I'm I'm using. It's going to have all four codes on there, all four ciphers. You'll notice on the, uh, so for example, if we look at the first one, Paul McCartney, just the name, you'll see the green numbers. So for example, the ordinal reduction or simple English gematria, you'll see a green number of 152. The numerology of that gematria code is eight. And so if we look at Paul McCartney, the numerology here based off the gematria is 8811. Okay. If we go to the next calculator, we'll see William Shepard. And we'll notice that his numerology is nine across the board. And this isn't necessarily common. It's actually pretty hard to get all four ciphers to have the same numerology. It's not going to seem that way because as we go through a decode with Bill and some of the Beatles uh, symbology, you're going to see a lot of nines across the board. Um, But that's not common. I don't want your audience to think that it's very easy to get nine numerology through all four ciphers. Okay. Um, also, if we look at the third one here, I just wanted to throw this out there. We talked a little bit about the Faustian bargain with Paul McCartney. Um, if we look at Paul McCartney's sacrifice, that also has a numerology of nine across the boards. So to me, I, I find that very interesting. It, it is my opinion that Paul McCartney was sacrificed for the success of the Beatles, but also for the success of Bill himself, because Bill was able to step into the role as the new Paul McCartney and he was sacrificed by the numbers, 9-11, 66, and then he, you know, of course, the Paul McCartney had the right numbers uh, through Gematria numerology. It was nine across the board. Okay, so what this is telling me, Gabrielle, is that when Billy says that Paul McCartney's all about the nines, he's really talking about 
the sacrifice of Paul McCartney. Absolutely. Um, because as we'll see, nines relate to Bill throughout his career. So it's not just, it's actually not Paul McCartney. Cause as you can see, Paul McCartney by himself is 8811 in numerology. But if you do Paul McCartney sacrifice, that's when it becomes a nine. Okay. Okay. If we go to the next slide. All right. So I wanted to show you guys Scottish Rite Freemason in, G in Gematria. So we look at the Gematria calculator. Scottish Rite Freemason equals nine numerology across the board. I'm of the belief that Bill is a Scottish Rite Freemason. And as a matter of fact, at this point, he, as you've mentioned before, Mike, he's higher up in the ranks now. He's in the illuminated degrees. He also tells us that his ancestry is from Scotland in memoirs. We can see him flashing the six sign here, the, the numerology of six. And then we also have uh, him being knighted by the queen. I just wanted to point out in this picture with him being knighted by the queen, he's wearing the Scottish Rite Freemason colors of black, white, and red, the alchemical colors. The queen herself, she's dressed in a in full blue roses. A lot of times in occult symbology, anytime somebody is pictured with a, a lot of roses, it means that they've had a lot of blood sacrifices for them. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's what's going on with the queen, but I'm just showing that that can be uh, symbolic of that. Um, also, I wanted to point out with Bill talking about the nines and the six, I have pages 409 and 421 of the memoirs book. On page 421, Bill tells us that it was exactly 666 years from the legacy of William Wallace, his ancestor, violently asserting himself as King of Scotland to when Bill opened the third Beatles phase in 1966. So 666 years from 1300. Okay, and let me just explain the phases to the folks. The first phase of the Beatles was when they were in Hamburg. That was the um, the group configuration with Stuart Sutcliffe and Pete Best. The second phase was John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And the third phase is when Billy took over the band in late 1966. All right, perfect. Um, if we go into some more gematria here, Mike, on the next slide, if we look at Sir Paul McCartney, we can see that Sir Paul McCartney has a, a numerology of nine across the board. Now, Memoirs of Billy Shears also has a numerology of nine. And of course, I showed you Scottish Rite Freemason has a numerology of nine. Some of your audience might say, well, it's titled The Memoirs of Billy Shears. Uh, when you are decoding and you're using gematria, it is perfectly acceptable to go through the layers. And removing the word the does not change the, the title of the book or the meaning. So that's why you're able to do that. Um, and then we can get some more insight as to why he would have called it the memoirs of Billy Shears versus the memoirs of Billy Campbell or William Campbell. Um, I simply think it was all about the numbers here as to why he used Billy Shears in that title. Okay. Do you have any questions on this one? No. Nope. I'm good. All right. So if we go to the next slide here. When you are using gematria, it is also important to recognize symbols because it, uh, gematria is one skill set. Recognizing symbols and recognizing colors are other skill sets. When you have all the skill sets together, they can really give you some great insight. OK, so if we go and we look at the symbol that Bill uses in the book, anytime he's referencing the Illuminati or the Freemasons, he has this little eye inside a triangle and it looks like Paul McCartney's eye. OK. Um, so I, I put a little snapshot of that in this slide so you, that the audience can look at. Um, and I'm referencing pages 297 and 298 of Memoirs, the Blue Book, okay? If we look, uh, traditionally, the right eye is the eye of Ra and the left eye is the eye of Horus. Bill talks about the difference between Ra and, and Horus in these pages. Um, if we look at Horus, Horus has a numerology of nine, okay? So we're going back to ancient Egypt symbolism which um, it looks like Bill is really into. I mean, he did have an album called... Um, Egypt Station. Egypt Station, exactly. So he's definitely into this this Egypt symbology, um, even if you look at different pictures of him. Um, but I did want to point out to the audience that when you're looking at this eye symbol that he uses, so if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, I have a general artistic expression of this, the eye, the eye of providence. And there are certain parts that make up the eye. And this is all part of the magical symbolism of this particular uh, image. There is a part that is missing from the symbol on Bill's picture or Bill's eye. And it's the one thirty second part. That part represents taste or tongue. And 
In my opinion, because Bill describes the differences between these symbols pretty thoroughly through these, this page, these two pages on memoirs, he knew what he was doing when he left that part of the symbol off. In my opinion, he's signaling other elites or other members of the club. And he could possibly be telling them that he's still keeping the secrets, even though he's revealing a lot to the reader. He still is the keeper of the secrets. Or there could be something else there. But I'm uh, conjecture on my part. I feel it's reference to something about secrets. So the curled piece on the eye from memoirs, which is the middle box, folks, on the slide at the bottom, that is different than the curled symbolism on the eye to the right? Correct. So the curl is just an artistic expression of that. You don't have to have the curl. It's the part of the eye that it's on. So if you notice right under the pupil, there's two parts that come out like a V or an upside down V. He is missing one of those parts. And the part that he's missing is the part that represents the tongue or taste. I see. Okay. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is some more symbology for your audience to look at. Okay. Um, I do want to reference uh, page 33 in the blue book um, where Billy will talk about the symbolism of cubes. He gives you the story about him throwing dice, and that's how he became all about the sixes. But I do want to let you know that cubes or cube is a reference to Saturn worship or black sun worship. And Bill's already showing us with the the right eye that he's following the sun. And it's possibly with this passage on page 33, he's also telling us he's into Saturn worship. But if we just simply look at the picture here, you can see like Gmail looks exactly like the Masonic Royal Rich Apron. Uh, you have the Facebook symbol that looks like Masonic Tubal Cane. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the compass and the square being a symbol of the Freemasons. And you can look at like Apple Store or the Android Store. They use that similar sim symbology. And there's some other symbols there, but Google definitely is showing you who their allegiance is to. There, there's no question. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, again, we see Bill flashing the sixes. And then, of course, he has that symbology of the wings. Um, I know he did play in the band wings, but I would suggest to your audience that this is also deeper in that he's reverencing the fallen angels. There are a lot of elitist or, or famous people that will use the wing symbology. And a lot of companies, for example, like Victoria's Secrets, they'll reverence the fallen by using the wings or the angel wings as symbology. Well, it's interesting because Crowley wrote a book called The Winged Beetle. And so Bill was a beetle, and then he formed the band Wings. So he's the winged beetle. I think that that's probably what he's telling us. And I agree. He's That sign he's making, yes, they're wings, but the wings is in reference to the fallen angels. I, I think that that's very astute, Gabrielle, on your part. The other thing that you blew my mind with, is in the book, yes, he does talk about, he's all about the sixes because he was very good at a particular game with dice, right? That's what he tells us. But the dice is a cube. So that story is another layer that needs to be decoded, and you decoded it, which is he's telling us that he's into Saturn worship. Yes. And now it's on page 333, right? Page 333, 333. Nine. So very good. Now, I know that the page numbers in memoirs are also clues. So certain information is encoded on certain page numbers that total to nine, as an example. For instance, on page 351 of memoirs, this is where Billy talks about the Committee of 300 and that the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were a creation of Tavistock. Three plus five plus one equals nine. This is very good. So I'm going to have to uh, share this with Tom. <laughs> I'm going to tell him, I'm going to tell Tom that Gabrielle figured out page 333. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, no, it, it, that's what was very enjoyable for me about reading this book. So please tell Tom that, that I found it very fascinating because it's like you're kind of trying to decode a mystery as you're reading the book. And that part was enjoyable to me. And Google, Google Chrome, the, um, the Divine King sign, and then Google Play is the seal of Satan. Yes, that's why I'm saying we have no question as to where the allegiance of Google, Google lies, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so they're definitely part of the club. If we go your, to tell your audience, we have reached the point where we get to decode Revolver. So if we go to slide 20 here, um, I here I have an album cover from the UK release of Revolver. 
on that release, the UK release, it's the official Beatles release. So that's why we would use this release versus a US release. Revolver, the word, has a nine numerology. Also on this uh, playlist of 14 songs, the only songs on this playlist to have a numerology of nine in Gematria are tracks eight, tracks nine, and tracks 11. Okay. So we want to focus on the nines in Revolver. Um, I also thought this was significant because this was the last album that Biological Paul was believed to have sang on. And so that's why I was decoding this album. Okay. We go to slide 21. Uh, Revolver's release was 8-5-1966. Right there in the release date, you have 8 plus 5 equals 13. Going back to the 13 Illuminati blood signs, in my opinion. And then we also have 666 in 1966. Again, nine is the mirror image of six or vice versa. Sixes are the, the mirror image of nine. So you can see that 1966 has uh, is a significant year for the occult and that you have the three sixes being reverenced there. I do believe this album was the judgment, sacrifice, and murder of Paul by the numbers, and I'll show you that through the numbers. Okay. If we look at the bottom left-hand corner here, I have Revolver already. The title equals nine. The U.S. version album length is 2747. 2 plus 7 equals 9, and 4 plus 7 equals 11, so you have 9-11, okay? And I do believe that that was the date the biological Paul was sacrificed, was 9-11-1966. If we look at the UK version of this album, the length is different. It's 3501, and if you look at 3 plus 5 plus 1, you get the breakdown of 9. So there's a lot of 9 symbolism in this album. Gabrielle, I have something else for you, too. Get a load of this. And the reason why the times are different between the UK and the US releases, folks, is because some of the songs on the UK release were not included on the US release. So I was prepared for this, so let me read this. On Revolver in the US, Capital Removed, I'm Only Sleeping, And Your Bird Can Sing, and Dr. Robert to get the album down to 11 songs. So isn't that interesting? That is interesting because since they went down to 11 songs, um, as I'm going to show in the Gematria, 11 is the number for murder. So murder has a Gematria of 11. Um, and again, 9 and 11, as we mentioned, are encoded throughout Bill's history with Paul, the biological Paul. So we have a lot of 9s already, but now you just show with the, the U.S. release that there's a, another 11. Okay. If we look at Andrew Bird's Can Sing, that was track eight, number eight on the UK re release. It had a numerology of nine. Now, eight also equals sacrifice. So sacrifice has a numerology of eight in Gematria. And we'll look at that at the next slide. Okay. So I believe song eight is pointing to sacrifice because sacrifice has a numerology of eight. If we look at the next song to have a numerology of nine on this album, that was track number nine. Good Day Sunshine. Now, in Gematria, the word judgment has a numerology of nine. And we will see that on the next slide. And then the only other song was track number 11. And as I've, I've already alluded to, 11, murder equals 11 in Gematria. So track number 11, the only other song with the numerology of nine, Dr. Robert. Also, in my opinion, when you decode it with Gematria, you're going to show that that was murder. So you have this album pointing to the judgment, sacrifice, and murder of Paul by the numbers. Uh, just quickly to remind the audience, the reason why judgment's in there, it's not because Paul did something bad. It's because of the Faustian bargain. And also, when man dies, we all have a judgment day. That, that's just like common mythos or common um, common belief system. So that's where the judgment part would come in. But the judgment, sacrifice, and murder of Paul, um, 11 is pretty significant. And in other rock stars murders you'll also see that number 11 pop up quite a bit as well because 11 in these ciphers is the number for murder well what's interesting with dr robert is that dr robert reduces down to nine and it is the 11th track so then we have the whole 9 11 yes sequencing again and then if we go to the next slide so that the audience can see the numerology of sacrifice judgment and murder uh sacrifice and again this is for your audience, this is why it's important to use the reverse ciphers, not just the forward ciphers. So we can see that in ordinal and reduction gematria, there's a numerology of one. But if you look at the reverse ciphers, 
they have a reverse numerology of eight, sacrifice coinciding with track eight. Then judgment, the reverse cipher was nine. That's uh, coinciding with track nine. And then, of course, with murder, the reverse cipher show that it's 11, and that coincides with Dr. Robert 11. So, Gabrielle, explain judgment within the context of what we're talking about here. Okay. So, as I mentioned before, I'm not saying that Paul McCartney did something terrible and he needed to be judged. It's simply just the fact that the Faustian bargain, there's also a connection with any time it's time to pay your bargain or fulfill your contract, you're being judged. It's judgment day. Also, just another twist on that is most people believe that when you die, everyone has to be judged by their their creator or their God. And so judgment is just simply by the fact that you're going to die. So when you die, you're going to have a judgment. So it's a conclusion in a sense? Correct. That That's a good way to put it. It's a conclusion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but in my opinion, this whole Revolver album by the numbers was already predicting that Paul was going to die. He was going to die on 9-11. And all the numbers were adding up. So all the stars, all the symbology was lining up for Paul to be sacrificed. Interesting enough, the next album would have been Sgt. Pepper, which, again, would have been Billy's entrance, right? Right. So um, if we go to the next slide, this is just some more nines for Bill or Sir Paul McCartney. And in chap um, page 592, he has dedicates a whole chapter to landmines and the liberation of the Irish people. He talks about landmines being a weapon of mass destruction and how government systems will use weapons of mass, mass destruction to control mankind. It's interesting because he repeats the word landmines and no more landmines constantly throughout this whole chapter. So it's significant to him in some way. But when I plug that in there, because he mentioned it so much, I found that no more landmines has a numerology of nine as well. And then I have a picture of him wearing the T-shirt. And, of course, he went on stage and performed a concert with that T-shirt. So uh, we may not know the full reason why No More Landmines has significance to him. Um, you could read that chapter on page 592 to get some insight. But, again, we see the nines again. So No More Landmines equals nine. So what Billy really should do is get a shirt with a big number nine on it is what he should do. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that would be more appropriate. <laughs> Um, if we go to the next slide here, I know that there are some people in the Paul's Dead community that believe that Bill may be the son of Crowley because he references the son of the magician in the book, The Memoirs of Billy Shears. I just thought it was interesting that the magician also has a numerology of nine. Now, my personal opinion, I, I put a picture of Aleister Crowley the same age approximate to what James Paul's son would be in this picture. I don't really see a strong resemblance, but I do believe that there is a blood tie connection in some way. And irregardless of whether Alistair is Bill's biological father, they definitely had an intimate relationship. Obviously, he was a mentor of Bill, and I do believe he had some sort of fatherly affection for Alistair. So I know in the book that Bill tells us that he had a traumatic experience at age three. And that that was around the time he was also recognized to have had uh, some musical talent. Alistair Crowley took him as a personal pupil until, and he tutored him until the age of eight. So, again, there is definitely an intimate connection and maybe some sort of fatherly connection there. But I'm not so sure that it's a biological father situation. We don't know. There are some folks that I'm connected to that are actually working on the genealogy and the ancestry. but. Nothing has been concluded. The way I answer the question when folks ask me is is that I don't know if it's his biological father, but I do know that there is a direct bloodline relationship with Crowley. And as you mentioned, Gabrielle, there is a fondness and a relationship, at least in Billy's mind and with regard to his ancestry, going back to Crowley. If we go to the next slide, we're going to see some more nines for Bill. So this is where Gematri, I feel, is very helpful. Gematria can get very deep and complex, but it also can just be very basic. So I don't want anyone to be intimidated by it. You can get into it as much as you want, or you can just get a base knowledge for you to understand some of the occult symbolism. If we go to the next slide, you can see uh, I have here it titled Magic Rituals and Blood Sacrifice. I wanted to talk about post-Beatles era with Bill. 
after the the Beatles broke up, it seemed that he didn't really have the success that he had before with the Beatles. Um, he still had the name and recognition, but it seemed that he was struggling. As a matter of fact, you know, by the time Red Rose Speedway came around, I noticed a lot of symbology on this particular album with Wings. You have Bill holding a, a red rose in his mouth and one red rose only. There's not multiple roses. There's one. So usually when you have just one red rose on a person that's famous that may have entered into a Faustian bargain, that's usually a symbol symbolism for blood sacrifice. There are lots of books that you could reference on that, but just for your audience, if they want to just quickly look into that, you can go to learnreligions.com and it'll give you all the symbolism of roses or flowers and their colors and their meanings to the occult um, and other religions. Okay. But red roses definitely reference blood and the life force of a person being their red blood. I noticed here that he looks like Paul McCartney, right? So he's, he's referencing the sacrifice of Paul McCartney by putting that red rose in his mouth. Um, because we have to remember that Paul McCartney's sacrifice was not only for the success of the Beatles, but it was also for the success of Bill in his role as Paul McCartney. Magicians or sorcerers or occultists, they don't necessarily have to always repeat the exact same ritual to conjure up the same entity for their help. An example of this would be like when Catholics take communion, they're not re sacrificing Jesus Christ, but they're remembering that that reverence or that ritual. Now, I'm not saying that Catholics are practicing magic, but again, the, the symbology is there. It, the power is still there when you take communion. So in my opinion, I felt like Bill was kind of reminding the entity that helped helped with the Paul McCartney sacrifice, like, hey, you know what? Remember, I had success with this. I, I need that help again here. Interesting to note with Red Rose Speedway, so there's lots of symbolism throughout the pictures of this album. Again, Bill being about the nines, this particular particular album wasn't necessarily that great of a success, but there was one significant difference about this post beetle work in that the song My Love reached number nine on the UK single charts. Okay, so then we have the number nine again. And again, on July 9th, so again, another nine, uh, the single was certified gold by the Recording Industry Association of America. Now, in my opinion, that completed the ritual. Once that happened, Bill wasn't planning his next album just yet. As a matter of fact, his band members were wondering, like, what was going on, if they were going to have another album. Once that single went from number nine to gold, Bill immediately went into planning the next album. I mean, it was, like, quick. And he was already recording by August 9th. They even went to Lagos, Nigeria. There was a lot of bumps along the way. But by the time he got there, they started recording their next album, Band on the Run which ended up being their most successful album and actually put Paul McCartney back on the music uh, charts. Um, it gave him post Beatles recognition and it still remains one of his most success successful albums. So I think that that was pretty significant. And I thought it was interesting that he did remember the sacrifice of Paul McCartney. I did want to talk a little bit about the numbers 9 and 11. So I'm going to reference a book by W. Westcott. It's called Numbers, Their Occult Power and Mystic Virtues. It's an interesting read for anyone that's just curious about the meanings of numbers. Um, so starting on page 89 in that book, he starts talking about the numbers of 9. He does talk about 9 being the mirror of 6 and 6 being the mirror of 9. So on that page, he talks about from a Christian point of view, 6 is the number of sin. 9 are the orders of angels. There is a Masonic order of nine elliptic knights in which nine roses, nine lights, and nine knocks are used. Nine is also the intention of earth under evil influences. Now, that really caught my attention because Bill does tell us tell us in the book of memoirs that the Beatles were used to break down traditional values. Um, Eleven is the essence of all that is simple, harmful, and imperfect. Eleven is the symbol of destruction, violence, defeat, and death. 11 allows a doctrine that evil spirits may haunt fields, so demons. So 11 gives access to demons. 11 is also called the number of sins because it exceeds the number of 10, the Ten Commandments um, in the Torah, and is less than 12, which is the number of grace and perfection. So 11 being the number of destruction and death when paired with 9, being the number of evil intentions on the earth, when they're put together 9-11 or 11-9, it commands great sadness, destruction, and death of the masses on earth. So in the occult, 11 is a very powerful number, but it's a dark, powerful number. Um, and so the intentions of that number, especially with nine, are not for good outcomes. 
for the general masses. If we go to the next slide here, I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about the symbolism of the Illuminati, because Bill does talk about that. And I'm going to use our own dollar bill here with the pyramid. But the capstone, you generally you will see the pyramid with a capstone not quite placed on top of the pyramid. The capstone is going back to ancient Egypt, Kabbalah, ancient Babylon religions. The capstone is reserved for Satan, his fallen angels, powers, and principalities. Okay, So it's reserved for those fallen beings and for their purposes. Bill does talk about on page 595 through 596 of the Blue Book of Memoirs. He does talk about uh, the capstone and the, the illuminated degrees. Okay. And in there, it's interesting because he talks about that being reserved for like universities or corporations, but he talks about it also being reserved for entities. And it's, he doesn't really expand on it, but that kind of let me know that he knows obviously that he's referring that these are for entities. It's not just for actual people. Um, and the way that for my research, Mike, that I found that this worked is that it, there will be an actual person at the top, but that person is being allowing themselves to be possessed, which I know people might be uncomfortable with. Another word to gently put that is they might be being guided by this principality, power, or being. So it's not just the human that you're paying homage to. So, for example, maybe like a Rothschild, you're actually being influenced by the entity that inhabits that person. And if we look at our dollar bill uh, pyramid, uh, people may have not realized that there are 13 layers of bricks before the, the capstone. That's very significant because, again, the 13 Illuminati bloodlines from the fallen angels. In those 13 layers of bricks, there are 72 bricks. This is reverence to, uh, in the Kabbalah, there are 72 pow powers of the name of God. Also in the Bible, the divine council in the Old Testament is the 72 uh, angels or powers were put over the earth to watch over humans, okay? And again, the capstone is reserved for the entities that control humans. If we go to the next slide here, I'm under the impression Bill does talk about participating in seances and connecting with uh, Paul's spirit, being influenced by spirits. So it's not a far stretch to elaborate that he is allowing himself to be guided by other angels or fallen entities. Um, so this is conjecture on my part, but I believe it's educated conjecture based off his his writings in the book. Um, I do believe that uh, based off the nine numerology may be allowing himself to be guided by the, the angel Gabriel or Gibriel would be a, another pronunciation of the name. But that uh, Gabriel has a numerology of nine. Now, I do want to just put it out there that this Gabriel would be one of the fallen. This is not the Gabriel of the Bible that came to Mary. Um, there are counterparts to names from the Kabbalah and the fallen also to the, the angels in the Bible. But these are two separate entities or angels, okay? But Gabriel uh, has a, a numerology of nine. Fallen angels has a numerology of nine. Um, and Mike, you had let me know that another alias that Bill likes to use is J. Paul McCartney. And interesting enough, there's another nine. So when you plug in J. Paul McCartney, you get a numerology off the gematria of straight nines. Um, and I just want the audience to see that this is something that is very intentional and happens a lot for Bill and throughout his his role as Paul McCartney. I wanted to give, if we go to the next slide, I wanted to give some more circumstantial evidence as to my opinion as to why Bill may be allowing himself to be influenced by other uh, entities like Nephilim, fallen angel, principalities or powers. Again, I do feel that Gabriel would be a good fit just because of the numerology of nine. But interesting enough, as I started looking into this, if you go to page 236 in the blue book, uh, he has a whole chapter titled Monday's Child. And looking at this chart with angel influence, uh, this is based off Jewish, Jewish mysticism um, and the occult. Uh, you notice that the days of the, the week, Sunday through, through Saturday, uh, if you look at Monday, Monday is governed or ruled by Gabriel. Um, it's also ruled by Cancer, which is 69 or 6 and 9. So there again, you have your 6 and 9s that Bill really reverences, right? And you, we can see that throughout his role as Paul McCartney. So the fact that he talked about Monday's child, and he does talk about when biological Paul died on September 11th, that Monday, September 12th, was his, his new day. And he also references in that chapter, Monday's child, Another significant Monday for his career as Paul McCartney. 
So Monday seems to be really important to him. Again, I do believe that Gabriel is influencing him. And I do believe 69, six and nines are another reverence that he's giving to this, this magic or this power. And his date of birth, as you have at the top of the um, chart, Gabrielle, the first bullet, September 9th, 1937, regroups to 9-11. Correct. And take a look at the page number of memoirs, 2 plus 3 plus 6 is 11. Yeah, Mike, I'm glad that you mentioned that about the page numbers because there's just so much decoding that can go on with this. It, it's I do want to make this statement for the audience. There is no way that a human being on their own can have all of this happen. But I, in my opinion, a lot of supernatural help goes into occultism and ritualism to make all of this happen because this is just unbelievable, the layers that we keep finding, uh, dissecting more and more and more. So uh, there's a lot that goes into this. But again, for your audience, it's important, I feel, to understand at least a base knowledge of this so you can kind of open your eyes and see what is happening and what influence these occultists are trying to bring to the masses. Well, the presentation was fantastic, Gabrielle. The amount of work that went into this and the decoding, I tip my hat to you. There's just a lot of work that went into this, and uh, it's an eye-opener. You should be very proud of the work. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I hope that uh, your audience will find some great information here, but it's been a pleasure, and I've had a lot of fun uh, doing this. So. Oh, it was great having you on, and you can come back anytime. So anytime you have more information or if there's any other area of research that you would like to talk about, just let me know. We'll get together and we'll put a show together and we'll get it out. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you, Gabrielle.